Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. I am, my name is Matthias Brewer. I am a faculty member in the chemistry department, uh, and I'm delighted today uh, to introduce our speaker, our Barack lecturer uh, for this afternoon, Dr. Caleb McLennan, uh, who's coming to us from the Wildlife Conservation Society. Uh, so some of you might be wondering why is a chemist hosting a uh, wildlife conservationist? And well, there, there's two reasons. The first of all, uh, just because I'm a chemist doesn't mean I don't like the environment, right? I think <laughs> chemists get a bad rap, but actually, you know, chemistry plays a pretty important role in environmental, uh, environmental work, environmental science, certainly testing and monitoring ecosystems as well as developing new materials to help remediation and, and developing new uh, materials that are biodegradable. So chemistry certainly does play a big role there. But the other reason, actually, there is a second reason, uh, and that's because Dr. McLennan and I go way back. Actually, we go back uh, till about 1990 or so is when we first met, and that was in high school. So we were in high school together. Um, in fact, we were in a band together called Danny G and the Blue Notes. <laughs> and I was, uh, <laughs> I was one of two guitarists. He was the lead singer and, and uh, front man. So, uh, so we won't ask him to sing today. He's <laughs> gone on to better things. But uh, one other interesting thing uh, from our history is that when we were young, we actually looked uh, quite a lot like each other. Um, so even now, we're a little bit similar, but if you get confused at the reception afterwards, he's the one with the good hair. Uh, that's uh, gone by on me. Uh, so sadly, after we graduated, we sort of lost touch. Uh, we went off to do our, our own things. Uh, and then fast forward to about 2008 or so, one day I was driving uh, into work here, uh, driving down Williston Road, listening to NPR, uh, being you know, pretty, pretty happy with myself in the position I was in, when lo and behold, suddenly I hear an interview come on about the coral reefs off the Marshall Islands, and they're interviewing Caleb McLennan. So suddenly, you know, I realized that, you know, that made me rethink my standing a little bit as he's getting interviewed on NPR. <laughs> but that's all right. Um, so uh, I wasn't really surprised about his success. Even in high school, he always had, you know, a certain drive and passion and, and willingness to, to go all in that, that few people had. Uh, so filling in the gaps there in his career, he graduated from Middlebury College with a bachelor's degree uh, in environmental studies and geography and then went on to earn a master's and PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University in international and environmental policy and development economics. Uh, he's now become a, a real leader in the field of environmental conservation. His expertise has been uh, cultivated through years of on-site practical field work, um, coupled with his graduate work in, in environmental policy and developmental economics. Uh, in his current position at the Wildlife Conservation Society, he serves as Vice President of Global Conservation Programs, and he leads the WCS's cross-cutting strategies to mitigate global drivers of environmental decline. So his job entails uh, finding creative ways to support WCS's conservation uh, portfolio, which is delivered by over 3,000 staff across 60 countries. Um, so this includes WCS's programs for oceans and fisheries, climate mitigation and adaptation, livelihoods, and markets. So these efforts focus on really large-scale problems, right, that only one organization themselves can't possibly solve. Uh, and so he also provides strategic leadership and representation for WS, WCS's efforts to build multi-institutional partnerships with NGOs, corporations, and philanthropic sector. Uh, to succeed where, uh, on these big, real big problems. Prior to his position at WCS, uh, he served for over eight years as the executive director of WCS's marine conservation portfolio. In this capacity, he directed their global marine conservation efforts to improve fisheries, establish effective marine reserves, and conserve some of the world's most important marine biodiversity. In this role, he managed a team of several hundred marine conservationists in the waters of 24 countries, over five oceans, in addition to uh, the conservation efforts of the New York Aquarium. Uh, before WCS, he spent over 10 years at sea aboard, uh, and abroad as an environmental advisor to the Republic of the Marshall Islands, a GIS analyst, and a marine scientist with Woods Hole Sea uh, Education Association. 
in addition to his current role at the WCS, he also holds an appointment as an adjunct faculty at Columbia University School of Public and International Affairs, where he teaches a class each spring. Uh, the Earth Institute Center for Environmental and or for Environment and Sustainability, and he serves as an overseer of the Woods Hole Sea Education Association, and he's an advisor to the New England Aquarium uh, Marine Conservation Action Fund, and also a strategic advisor to the Global Partnership for Sharks. So I have no idea how he manages his time. But uh, so before I turn the floor over uh, to Dr. McLennan, uh, there's just two items of business I need to address. Uh, the first is to remind you all that right after this, um, there is a reception up in Waterman Manor, which is on the top floor of this building, where you can have a chance to a meet and greet. And, and uh, I don't know what they're serving at the reception. Great. Cider, cheese, crackers, cookies. So show up, at least for the food, but also for the uh, interaction. Uh, and finally, the last thing that I need to do is present as a small token of our appreciation a, for coming all this way, a, a small gift basket of Vermont chocolates and coffees. So there's a take-home prize for, for you as well. OK, and with that, I will take that beautiful picture off and put on an even better one. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thanks for Yeah. So, apologies for that. Audiovisual check. Not, not, in, not on my CV was uh, audiovisual. So, we'll, let's talk about um, uh, frontiers in terms of where we come from and futures in, in global conservation. Um, but to start, uh, I, as, as Matthias mentioned, I ended up getting my bachelor's partially in geography, but um, there's a long history of map making and, and mapping in my family. My aunt and uncle are cartographers by profession. Uh, for their entire career, particularly in the field of conservation. As a result, I received map puzzles as a child and spent a lot of time uh, learning about the various parts of the world based on what color they were, according to maps. Um, two, uh, my uncle and my grandfather were uh, city planners outside of Boston. And um, my, as I've gotten older, I've, I've learned more about my grandfather's career. He actually proposed something called the Inner Belt, which was going to run through Cambridge. Uh, as a highway through the middle of Boston, and uh, I think probably fortuitously for the current residents of Cambridge, it wasn't uh, wasn't built, um, but it was part of the grand age of city planning where uh, people imagined a, a different future for our cities, uh, built more and more on cars, kind of the opposite of how we think now. And about 30 years later, um, actually the same aunt and uncle who gave me those puzzles as, as kids, uh, did one of the first models of Boston before uh, all the all the land filling. Uh, that went in to develop the city as we know it uh, today. So I've overlaid that on top there. Um, but as Matthias as I mentioned, I ended up going on to Middlebury College and getting really infatuated in geography, particularly geographic information systems. And I uncovered a copy here of um, some early modeling we did of, uh, and I participated in the, on the lab team that did a, a low costing of a wolf corridor between, potentially between um, the Adirondacks and Algonquin uh, Provincial Park in, in, in Canada. Um, so at uh, this time when you did GIS, you, you, you typed some command lines in and then you wrote a note on the keyboard, put it on the keyboard, and left for about 12 hours, hoping nobody touched that computer or else, uh, just because it took so long for these systems to process. So luckily, it's a little different uh, today. Um, after college, I, 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 mapping still was part of some of the things I did, but it was more focused on, on nautical charts. I, I ended up spending five years. Uh, working on various uh, boats, particularly with Woods Hole Sea Education Association. And really, the ocean became uh, a learning laboratory where I was teaching, but also learning quite a bit about the physical aspect of the ocean. Um, somewhere along the lines, visiting dozens of countries, seeing co communities uh, interacting with the sea for all the benefits, but also all the challenges 
uh, that they're facing, I became and decided to switch from natural sciences more over to social sciences and ended up focusing on, on policy and economics. And uh, the map making stayed with me. I actually helped the Marshall Islands government uh, negotiate its, its official maritime boundary with the Federated States of Micronesia. And this is actual extract from the treaty that we negotiated while I was there. Uh, so a line on a map, yes, but also important in delimiting those fisheries that those countries, one of their most important economic sectors that they use. So naturally, after living on boats, islands, um, and, and thinking about uh, how the world is organized, I had to move uh, to, the, to the Bronx in New York City, which is where every ocean conservationist wants to live. Um, but I ended up working, uh, and, and I still am today, for the uh, Wildlife Conservation Society, which is based at the Bronx Zoo, formerly known as the New York Zoological Society, uh, founded in 1895, and now a global conservation organization. Wh why did I go there? WCS uh, has really been a leader in the field of global conservation, um, helping create over its uh, over 100 year history, over 400 protected areas around the world in the United States and abroad, supporting governments in this process and really being a leader in that world of conservation. So it was an honor to, to join their organization and now to, to help lead some of our conservation efforts. Um, and the map making continued, but this time working to support field, uh, our field programs uh, in their partnership. In this example, with the, the government of Gabon, who last, uh, last year declared about a quarter of their exclusive economic zone uh, set aside from fishing in a major declaration by Ali Bongo, the president uh, there of Gabon. Uh, and one, one final bit that uh, we, we were able to do is help mobilize a significant fund for increasing these lines in the oceans, these protected areas. As I'll talk, get to it a little bit later in the talk, um, there's a tremendous surge of interest in marine protected areas today, uh, and it's a really exciting field to, to be in. So that was a little bit more about me, and you're thinking, well, that's not why we came here. What, what was happening to the planet during this period? I'll generalize the timelines a little bit. Um, but it's really important and, and uh, I think essential to recognize that as we have our personal stories, there is also this systemic change happening around us. So, you know, in my lifetime, the population of the planet has nearly doubled. We're at about four, four billion at that time, we're approaching eight billion today. The global economy has increased four times the size, accounting for inflation. Poverty at the same time is actually 20% of what it used to be in relative terms, in terms of as measured by people living on $2 a day. And childhood, childhood and mortality is halved. It, uh, health factors have, are improved tremendously as measured by um, childhood mortality. So the planet has gone through these Im immense changes from a, a demographic perspective. And you could look at any of those factors, um, hopefully not so much the poverty and health factor, but the first two and think that there's positives and negatives of each. Um, we know. It's taken a tremendous toll on the planet. In that same time, we've lost tenfold of the world's tiger population. We had um, about 40,000 in the 70s, and now we're down to less than 4,000 wild tigers living on the, on the planet today. So we'll go through a little bit here, thinking about what's happening for the future um, of the conservation movement, reflecting on this change that has happened over at least my lifetime and the time that I've been involved. Uh, when Matthias and I were in high school, since it's pointed. Uh, the United Nations uh, countries came together was, and negotiated a series of conventions known as the Rio Conventions. One of them is very well known, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, as is realized today through the latest agreement, the Paris Agreement. Uh, also, a Convention on Desertification, which is less well known, and the Convention on Biological Diversity, which was recognizing the crisis of biodiversity that was facing the planet at that time. Um, but a, a little uh, less well known, but very important for the conservation sector. The world was wrestling with this decline and thinking we, biodiversity is both important locally, but also a global good and provides global services as well. Um, a, 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 a few decades later after implementation, the convention, the parties to the convention came together to negotiate <coughs> 20 targets for biodiversity conservation, known as the Aichi targets. Uh, you are not meant to read all these targets. This is to show that these were um, negotiated text and committed to by the countries of the world. A series of targets on mainstreaming biodiversity conservation, a series of targets on mitigating some of the, um, uh, the risk to species extinctions. Many of them not tied to specific numbers. One of the ones we'll focus on, <coughs> particularly in the conservation sector, because it was tied to numbers, is Aichi Target 11, 
which committed the countries of the world that were parties to the Convention of Biological Diversity to conserving 17% of their terrestrial area and 10% of the world's oceans, a combined uh, global commitment. So as these declines are happening, this is just one example of how the world's coming together to think about solutions. What I'd like to do is, dive, is, is go through three focal areas in conservation. First, the oceans, then the world's forests, and then thinking about combined about the, uh, the protected area, the state that we try to use to manage wilderness, and look at some of the change that has happened in each as we think about where we're going in the future. So first, with the oceans. Let's start with global fisheries. We are in a, we're in a situation where we have had tremendous capitalization from the 1950s. If you can't see the uh, x-axis there, that's from 1950 to, to 2013. This is FAO data, so reported by countries. Global fisheries have increased significantly as we've um, commercialized but also capitalized our fishing fleets. And we've, we've reached a, a level where we're, t we're pulling out the same amount every year. Uh, this graph is a little misleading because behind this curve you have stocks that are declining and then new stocks coming up and emerging, uh, 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 finding fish, po fisheries populations that are further and further away. There's a number of ways to show this, but probably one of the most um, uh, uh, apparent to me is looking at the difference between developing and developed country fisheries. So the blue line on this graph is the, is the fisheries of the developed world, uh, reaching to the, to the mid to late 1980s, get it, reaching their peak, and then as those fisheries collapsed and we had to restrict our effort, of course, fleets moved abroad and into developing countries, which has seen the skyrocketing uh, amount of catch. So quite a divergence there happening as we overexploit our fisheries domestically and then abroad have to, uh, are, are exploiting areas where we know less and less about what the uh, fisheries resource has. Also a very significant um, uh, shift that's happened in fish production in the world's oceans is the rise of global aquaculture. So the, on, the, on the orange part of this is the total capture production, that initial slide that I showed on fish production, and the blue is the rise of aquaculture. Today, the fish that you eat on your plate, you're more likely that that fish uh, that we actually consume um, as of about 2013, more likely that that was farmed versus fished in the wild. So we have a massive substitution of our, of our fish production system towards farm fish and aquaculture. And in the last few years, while well, some of you have been at, at UVM, we've, we've gone through that switch from, far, uh, from wild to farmed. So these changings taking place, a lot of, most of this aquaculture development is also ha happening in developing countries, areas where there might not be as, as, as solid uh, environmental codes and introducing uh, significant challenges. Also, one last point on, on, uh, on fisheries before we move on to some, some news that's happening that's very positive, is the increased understanding that <coughs> of the global fish production that we are reporting to the FAO, the slides that I just showed you, is a significant underreporting. This is data from the Sea Around Us project at the University of um, British Columbia, where they've remodeled fisheries, particularly in developing countries, based on household surveys and calculated that small-scale fisheries, that those, those, those fisheries happening in artisanal and nearshore fleets, in some countries, such as the case of Mozambique here, might be four times the harvest of the official reported catch. And these areas are extremely uh, governance poor, uh, and even more challenging to, to try to manage, especially from a centralized way. So we have these dynamics of a significant shift from the developed to the developing world, the rising aquaculture developing world, and also a, a significant underreporting and uh, a lack of management of the fisheries, particularly small-scale fisheries in the developing uh, world. So let's just look at one example with the time we have where this, this situation is being managed quite, quite effectively. Um, WCS actually works in, in Belize and has been supporting um, uh, as a partner to the government and other uh, organizations there for <clears throat> over, over three decades, helping create the marine reserve system, but also now supporting significant fishery reform. And uh, just last year, for the first time ever, uh, Belize did something that uh, is actually more common in the coast of Maine, signing uh, uh, territorial use zones to different fishing groups and, and limiting access or, or managing access across the entirety of their territorial sea. And this has received incredible support from the small-scale fishers that are engaged there, increased improved catches, and much better enforcement and management. This is a, a model of, of increasing the tenure or management rights of fishers in a more decentralized fashion and relying less on the central government to control and more on fisher groups to organize 
and do uh, and create their own rules and systems to manage these. And it's actually also also been encoded in the FAO <coughs> voluntary guidelines on small scale fisheries. So a real it, interesting tipping point as we as we now understand the extent of small scale fisheries around the world where people are starting to think about and countries are taking a lot of action to improve this catch. Incredibly important from conservation, but also for the livelihoods of these fishers. Moving on to another area of the oceans. Um, the greatest threat to marine species today, the greatest the species that under the greatest threat are the world's sharks and rays. Um, uh, 10 years ago, we wouldn't even be talking about this because it wasn't necessarily in the mainstream media. Images like this, a rooftop in this case in Hong Kong, that, was, that, that has been repeated uh, uh, through a number of media sources have helped people understood the grave threat to the world's uh, sharks and rays. Skyrocketing catches, significant values, and essentially the same problem that I just articulated with small-scale fisheries, not very much management at all, very little rules on the ground as you'll see. Just to get a sense, this is a, a graph <coughs> also produced by the Food, Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, of the rising trade in shark fins um, from the mid 70s to today, so a significant bo boom in shark fin trade. And geographically looking at this trade, as, as probably many of you understood and knew, the, 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 the um, width of the arrow is the volume and the, obviously the directionality going so primarily to East Asia. But what a lot of people don't know about the shark uh, trade and the, and the um, pressure that's on it is that actually the volume of meat, shark meat, and shark and ray meat that is traded globally is greater. And it's actually heading in a very different direction towards Europe and also to some countries in South America. So it's not a unidimensional problem, but it is growing increasingly with our lack of, uh, or historic lack of management of these populations. And in many countries and, and waters, shark and ray populations have been at least locally uh, extirpated or significantly diminished. As I mentioned, the, uh, as, a, as, as shown here in a paper by uh, Lindsay Davidson in 2015, the, uh, the management rules and regulations of shark and ray fisheries is just not present in so many countries. Even basic rules for, for finning, but also having adequate shark and ray management plans, not regarded as a, as a productive economic fishery that needs to be managed. So there is a change in the last few years which is really hopeful for sharks and rays. And actually it's been considering them more under the wildlife treaties, the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. In 2013, for the first time ever, uh, the Bahardis to CITES, through a two-thirds majority, listed the, 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 the first ever commercially traded uh, uh, species of sharks and rays. This is they're listed on Appendix 2, which doesn't ban their trade, but it provides significant um, restrictions on the trade in that it can only happen if it's deemed sustainable by scientific evidence. So it's a big shift from an unregulated, uh, traded uh, product of, of wildlife or, or fishery to something that is now entering the regulatory regime. And this happened both in 2013 and again in 2016. The last two uh, conference of the parties have ended up listing a range of species of, of sharks and also larger manta and mobulid uh, rays. Tangibly, what does this do? Many people um, can be jaded about international treaties and their effectiveness. Um, one of the world's largest uh, shark and ray fishing countries, Indonesia, very soon after, due to a combination of this as well as domestic uh, uh, pressure, fully protected uh, mantas in their country and as a result eliminated the uh, legal trade in these at the country level. Previously they had been and also created one of the world's largest manta sanctuaries in eastern Indonesia and followed that up by actually uh, engaging in um, uh, uh, arresting and providing fines to those uh, individuals that were trading in these, in these commodities. And so significant decline in manta catch has happened as a result quite rapidly from the 2013 and 2016 listings. Moving on to the last piece with oceans just briefly, uh, we can't necessarily cover everything but with coral reefs, we have another uh, emerging uh, uh, crisis in, in our hands as probably many of you know. Um, the world's coral reefs were significantly on the radar, interestingly, in 1992 around the Rio Conventions. They were, they were included in the original Aichi targets um, as a priority. And of course, we knew climate was a threat because of the particular sensitivity of coral reefs to heating, 
where they bleach and expel their, their symbiotic ozozen algae, ozozentheli. So, um, but what has happened in the last three or four years, as you've seen probably also in the media, is this intensive bleaching, particularly in the Great Barrier Reef and Pacific, where the, the heating events are repeating over and over and contributing to massive die-offs, 30 to 50 percent of the surface, area, surface uh, reefs, not the deep water reefs, on the Great Barrier Reef bleaching, creating massive, uh, a, a significant crisis. Um, in the world for the long-term survival of these species. So this is a moment in time for coral reefs, and, uh, for the conservation of coral reefs where um, it has always been a priority but has been elevated to a new level. And there's an emerging set of both governments uh, through the International Coral Reef Initiative and the UN Environment Program, as well as philanthropy to make a major investment in identifying places that have the most likelihood to survive uh, maybe they have cold water upwelling. Maybe they're actually backwater um, shallow lagoons that, ha that have been um, evolved uh, to handle high, high heat stress areas to actually prioritize those places for conservation so that when the heating vents come through, those, those, those uh, can serve as refugia. But then also other folks are looking into uh, identifying and even doing some genetic work to find the most heat tolerant uh, taxa or strains of the species and repropagating them after bleaching events as well. Um, this, is, this is just emerging now in the last couple of years going from ideas into practice because basically business as usual for coral reefs means losing them all and something has to change. And will be interesting as we move on through 2020 uh, where we end up in the space with corals and if these investments uh, uh, pay off. You, one, of the, one of the biggest governmental investments has been on the Great Barrier Reef um, dealing with, with the significant amount of pollution as well as climate change that's coming from land. So moving on to the land here, uh, let's talk about one, one aspect particularly um, of importance both globally and in terms of for, for climate but also for biodiversity, the world's forest estate. So as with many, as with all global statistics, the dimensionality matters. If you look at historic, this will be, this pattern is very classic for many environmental issues. It's the same pattern you see for the ivory trade, paint the same pattern you see for climate, where um, much of, in this case, temperate uh, forests, particularly in the de current developed part of the world, were massively deforested and actually are now going into recovery. So a huge historical legacy of deforestation, followed by the rapid deforestation of the tropics. On a, on a multi-decadal scale, def the good news for, for our world's forests is the deforestation has slowed down tremendously. We think maybe f the levels uh, today are 50% or less than what they, where they were a few decades ago. As you'll see in some of the data, it's hard to know this for sure. So there's a multi-decadal uh, slowdown. Um, th this is specifically advertised and, and um, reported by the FAO through their classification uh, systems. Um, some countries particularly have led the way, as you, as you probably know, some countries are experiencing increased deforestation, but in the last uh, uh, 20 years or so, Brazil has shown great leadership through a combination of increased enforcement, promoting indigenous rights, um, decentralizing their, their, uh, uh, their monitoring and surveillance, and having much more, a much stronger legal framework uh, for, for the uh, protection of deforestation in the Amazon. Interestingly, the last few years, they've loosened up some of the regulatory control, and we're seeing an increased, uh, a slight increase in deforestation. So it's something, a watching brief, but if you look at the significant decline in deforestation rates in the Amazon, it's really important to recognize uh, this success story. One really important aspect of uh, tropical forest conservation, particularly in the Amazon, is recognizing the role of communities. This is another success story. It's not ubiquitous in that every single place it, it's, nece it's necessarily a silver bullet, but across the Amazon, there's good evidence to suggest that community-based, uh, uh, is particularly indigenous uh, lands, are five times more effective at slowing the rate of deforestation than other methods around them. And specifically, this one example is uh, the Takana uh, people in Bolivia who are working, and they, they demonstrated a three times more effective rate at conserving their communal lands than the other approaches around them. So this is, this is due to, similar to the local fisheries management uh, uh, idea in Belize, and also Costa Maine and other places, when you provide that local control and local incentives, there's a better uh, chance for uh, better solutions for both people, but also for the forests as well. 
Another approach for forest conservation that is really in the experimental phase due to the slow pace of our um, climate negotiations and process, although till recently we thought it was picking up a bit, um, and that is the, um, uh, the um, idea of carbon credits and reduce emissions from deforestation and degradation. Uh, WCS works to support two um, carbon credit generating forests, uh, one in Makira, which is the largest intact forest in Madagascar, and the other in Sema in, in uh, Cambodia. And these places you have to demonstrate through remote sensing and GIS and show that there is a trajectory of forest decline, but through payments appropriately to both communities, to government, and to technical agencies, you can halt that deforestation and hence get carbon credits for it. This has contributed to a significant decline in deforestation rates in both the places where we're, we're working, as well as a number of other uh, uh, red credit uh, forests around the world. Importantly, one of the challenge, there's a lot of challenges to the red approach. One is the ballooning effect or leakage where you might protect this forest, but what about the neighboring one where you can now um, secure the same amount of fuel wood but at twice the rate because you can no longer uh, work in the protected area. And for this reason, the, the red marketplace is, and idea is moving more to a jurisdictional level. So thinking about countrywide red programs versus just single forest so you don't end up with that um, leakage effect. So the statistics that I presented so far in forests are all from the Food and Agricultural Organization. They're uh, reported by countries um, in a consistent manner for a, a long period of time. We are getting, we generally the world, getting much smarter at how to uh, understand forest cover. Here's data from the World Resources Institute's Global Forest Watch, which is using ra uh, active remote sensing data to get a better sense in near real time from a global change perspective of what's happening to the global forest uh, uh, state. And, and here we're actually seeing a slow rise again in deforestation rates as we're having tremendous development pressures happening on the world's uh, particularly tropical uh, uh, forests. And through an through a open portal you can see this uh, on a global perspective or you could zoom into an unprotected area where you're working to visualize on their platform, Global Forest Watch, and importantly to decentralize, and I would also reference democratize access to what's happening to the world's forest estate. So just three layers here. This is Global Forest Watch forest cover. This is showing forest decline uh, uh, since 1990 in pink, where you see all the areas that have declined. And then mon many aspects of the world's forest, particularly in the temperate world, in pink, in uh, purple here, are actually showing forest recovery. So it's a very dynamic system, and you need to um, understand the, at, at a very uh, local level what's happening. So it's more new. It, it is more nuanced. With greater amounts of information, we can go deeper and think about what strategies to to deploy at the at the level um, that matters for these forests. There's, there are also political commitments. There, t there were some in the IET targets. They were not as, um, as hard as, as they needed to be for forests. So in 2014, some, uh, there was a voluntary declaration called the New York Declaration on Forests with the goal to half forest deforestation rates by 2020 and fully eliminate deforestation rates by 2030. Um, some countries, not all countries have signed on to this, but it's a sign of growing political momentum around trying to slow deforestation rates. Interestingly, as that is being signed, better and better data is showing rising deforestation rates. And even the reporting mechanism of the New York Declaration on Forests is showing those trends of increasing deforestation rates. So the opposite way it was intending to go. Um, however, with forests, not, it, it's not just deforestation that matters. And this photo kind of gives you an example of what I mean. Increasingly, we're, we're learning as we have better and better data about the world's forest, not just from remote sensing, but also from on the ground, say, crowdsource road data, where people are saying which, where different paths are moving through around the world. There's, a, there's amazing uh, new data sets that are coming in. And we know when you drive a road through a rainforest, the actual deforestation that happens from that road, it's close to linear, so it's not so much from a square kilometer perspective. But the degradation impact of that goes out 20, 30 kilometers into the forest. So the quality of the forest declines significantly. And so while we, while we have on a multi-decadal scale um, slow deforestation rates, even with a recent slight increase, 
we are significantly losing the battle and the rates of forest degradation, that loss of forest quality, are actually twice that of the rates of, of uh, deforestation. This map shows you, you can just barely see the light green is the global forest cover of the planet. The dark green is what's left as intact. It's only about 20% of the world's standing forest today is actually intact and not degraded in any way. So we are having these multi-layer challenges uh, for forest conservation. Nowhere in any policy statement commitment is the idea of intactness included. We need to think about intactness targets, targets to protect against both degradation as well as deforestation. So combining this together and thinking somewhat agnostic of terrestrial mean and thinking about what's left on the planet for wilderness and what are one of our main tools for protecting wilderness, um, the protected area. Some recent research with, as we have data, particularly some done by WCS uh, collaborators um, at the University of Queensland and some of our scientists have shown that we are continuing to experience this erosion of the world's remaining wilderness. We think, uh, as a, a stu study that came out in science last year, about a tenth of the world's wilderness has been lost since the 1990s. We have less than a quarter of wilderness across land, agnostic of, of ecosystem, uh, left uh, today on land. And interestingly, when you look at what's left in the world's oceans, um, some work Ben Halpern has done has shown that essentially the entire ocean has been impacted. The fluid nature of the ocean much easier tr uh, transmits impacts as well as the pressures of climate are, are so great on the ocean uh, itself. So we have an a, a increasing loss of wilderness on the planet, both in terrestrial and marine, in increasing loss of those last intact places. As I mentioned, Aichi Target 11 was one of the strategies to try to, to deal with this. Uh, expanding pr protected areas, both terrestrial and marine protected areas. And here is an interesting story. Increasingly, the world's terrestrial target is approaching the 17% figure um, from when the convention was signed, uh, 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 committed to in the early 90s at about 15%. And rapidly, for those of you who have been following what's happening in marine conservation, we're having experiencing significant growth of marine protected areas. Importantly, this graph is showing just that in jurisdictional waters, so just within the exclusive economic zones of countries. When you actually look at the whole ocean, it's less than 7% that's protected, so we still have a ways to go towards this target. So on paper, the world is rapidly, uh, countries of the world are rapidly increasing their protected area state to meet Aichi Target 11, which is, which is exciting. However, Similar to so many of the other stories we said, the impact of those protected areas, the actual protection, most peer-reviewed work that looks at what the rules and regulations or the actual management capacity, both in terrestrial and in marine, show that a much lower percent of the world's ocean, in this case, and in the next slide you'll see land, is actually protected. So while we're meeting the, the, the written intent of the target of the percentage, we're not meeting the other part of the target that's talking about the actual effective management. And this is a really real challenge as we in some uh, press, you might see this great congratulations to the world of meeting its, approaching to meeting its protected area targets and realizing that's really the first step, even of those original Aichi targets, as we start thinking towards the future. So here's an article by the former, uh, uh, publication by the former head of NOAA, Jane Lubchenco, and some colleagues looking at that only a fraction, about 1.6% of the ocean, actually is truly protected, contrary to that figure that we mentioned uh, earlier. As well, a similar, uh, the same group at WCS at who, in, in University of Queensland that worked on the wilderness study also looked at the state with all this remote sensing and other data of, um, of the uh, protected area habitat itself looking at just the terrestrial state and found that of all those protected areas, one third of them are under incredible intense pressure. You're seeing uh, protected areas with industry, mining, communities of tens, 20, even hundreds of thousands of people actually living within in fully commercialized areas within these protected areas. Um, this chart on the left is cut off for space, but the, the high red areas uh, are areas where the protected areas are really not serving the purpose that they are in, intended to serve. So, so at both on land and in the sea, you're seeing a significant uh, a gap between what is committed to, drawn on paper, and that is what is actually uh, managed. 
Uh, one last component of this before we start reflecting and thinking a little bit about where this takes us for the future um, is not only is there a challenge of, the, of, of managing that which is created, but there's a really interesting program called Protected Area Degazettement um, and, deg and Degradation, pa the PAD tracker that looks at over 4,000 events where similar to maybe the most notorious here in the U.S. with Bears Ears, you have protect areas that have been created, but then significantly uh, restricted either in their size or intent and downgraded. And so uh, actually creating the protected areas is only a beginning of the work if you also have to um, deal with the challenges of this degazettement and degradation and downgrading of protected areas as well. This too is a crowdsourced platform actually where you can, um, from wherever country you are, log in and talk about what's happening to your protected areas since the understanding of these is quite, quite vast. So thinking about at least a select component of how we, of air aspects for conservation in the world's oceans and in land and then thinking about wilderness and area space protection. Uh, originally the idea is to talk about so where are we going uh, post 2020. Uh, 2020 matters. Uh, some policy wonks have been calling it the super year because there's so many commitments and it's actually not just in the policy circles but also corporate circles and many NGOs including WCS have a 2020 plan. So many commitments will be measured in that year. Did, did we meet them but also what's next? Um, next month, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity is having its conference of parties in Egypt, and then a year from now, uh, the 2020 COP will be in China. And, the, and it is at that COP that there will be a new set of commitments for biodiversity. And the question is, where should the countries be going and committing uh, to on the political front to um, uh, continue uh, their trajectory? The what's, what's working, what's not working, what needs to change? Uh, simultaneous to this, uh, as, as many people know, we have, we have gone through the sustainable development goals. And one of the challenges for nature conservation is mainstreaming, yes, but then also having select targets and goals in, in them of themselves. With the SDGs, there's two targets, uh, uh, life, below land, life below water and life on land, that particularly uh, call out conservation issues. They repeat those IHE targets of 10 and 17 percent by 2020, but then also a range of, uh, of other sustainable development goals on food, nutrition, uh, health, and climate that intersect with the IHE targets as well. So the harmonization of these global commitments is important. The next slide is not to uh, necessarily uh, be a total, completely absorbed, but here is the path to, uh, to, the, to the COP in China next year. You'll see a, a, a range of different uh, of discussions, uh, meetings, and events to gather ideas from the world. And we're really, we're not at the beginning, but the official governmental process began at the beginning of 2018, where it was some stakeholder dialogues to be part of the conservation, part, part of the conversation and discussion about what the world should be committing to in 2020 for the next 10 years of biodiversity con conversation, conservation. So it's an important time to be reflecting on what's worked, what hasn't worked. So here are our thoughts or my thoughts on where we might be going. One of the accepted challenges from a, that, that, that has been discussed at some of these um, events that have already been taken place led by the Convention on Biological Diversity is that there needs to be a greater effort to mainstream and get biodiversity issues in within the priorities of other sectors and not necessarily silo itself off within um, sectors that think about economic development, sectors that think about technological innovation, financial innovation, but also leaning into this idea of decentralization and democratization. And it's the combination of technology, decentralization, democratization that we think we can see significant uh, transformative change. The convention and the, the stakeholders are going to are trying to think about that and how that could be possibly enshrined in some of the commitments coming out. So I have a couple ideas we'll put out there before we open up to questions. Um, I, I would like to say, importantly beyond 2020, we cannot lose track of what has been what has been done so far. Remember, many of the protected areas that are in the world across land and sea, this is a, a map showing the official world database on protected areas, are not managed adequately. As we leap to ideas about future expansion goals, we need to remember to take stock and significantly invest double, 
triple, and maybe tenfold increase our combined global investments in managing the world's protected areas that we've created. We've gone through our startup growth curve for protected areas. Now we need to manage and realize the returns on that investment, even as we take on other issues. So while the convention and many parties to the convention will be thinking about new and innovative ideas, it's really important to think about um, uh, re uh, redoubling our efforts across the protected areas that have been created. But thinking about how to make some leaps forward, here's a few programs that we're working on that embrace this idea of both technology but also um, finance and democratizing the data that we use for conservation. Um, we have uh, all of these, interestingly, are partnerships. Um, WCS works in a number of countries around the world, but we work almost nowhere alone. And especially when we're getting into global initiatives, it's really important to work across partners. Uh, one of the things is managing protected areas is incredibly costly. So we've, we've worked with a number of organizations to create the SMART partnership that is a, a law enforcement efficiency tool, essentially helping use, they're now working on even an artificial intelligence module to predict where enforcement infractions will happen based on past data and then reallocate in patrols out there. This is freely available to any country of the world and as a result has been downloaded and used by hundreds and hundreds of protected areas in dozens of countries around the world. So we need to scale this type of technology that helps uh, make enforcement and management of protected areas much more efficient and much more uh, effective. Uh, another project that's just kicking off which is really exciting is um, a, a collaboration called Wildlife Insights. This product is just emerging. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of how we understand and know about the biodiversity, particularly in dense tropical forests, is through the use of camera traps because you can't use regular survey line transect data because many of the species won't be around or they're at nighttime when you can't detect them. So camera traps are relatively low cost and efficient to gather the data, but very expensive when it comes in a time and effort to analyze that data. So this partnership, uh, Wildlife Insights, which is just emerging, is to use the same idea of artificial intelligence to, to automatically automate the detection and sensing of animals that come through down to the individual. But importantly, not just for, say, tigers and jaguars and the, the, the main species you might be looking for, but the other dozens of prey species, which we can't use that data currently because it's too, too time and effort intensive to manage. So this would significantly increase the amount of data available on biodiversity across the places we work. Similarly, uh, working on, on this in coral reef conservation, on, uh, 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 on significantly improving the efficiency of uh, collecting but then sharing for global analysis on coral reef, a, a project called Mermaid, looking at both pooling this data on the cloud as well as um, immediately visualizing the results so we have a better sense of where things are happening at time. Right now, a lot of data is collected on paper, input by hand, and all those creates a lot of significant errors. We Sharks and Rays, it's a partnership, um, Paul Allen's uh, philanthropy is funding called FinPrint, a series of beta remote underwater video uh, cameras to, to better census the world's sharks and rays around uh, marine ecosystems. And beta remote underwater, remote underwater video can be what, quite affordable. Again, it's that analysis side. So can we use um, AI and other uh, uh, cloud data management to get that data managed r more rapidly and available to decision makers, but also to the general public, similar to the way we think about Global Forest Watch. And probably the best example of this, I put a bunch of emerging ideas out there. Here's one that's working today, Global Fishing Watch, intentionally um, labeled and similar to Global Forest Watch, where using artificial intelligence, a partnership with uh, Google and Oceana, they have modeled fishing activity on the automated, uh, automatic identification systems, AIS, of fishing vessels around the world, albeit the larger ones, but they can model and tell when a boat is fishing versus linearly transecting and create these heat maps of where fishing effort is happening around the world without any vessels in the water. The biggest cost to managing fisheries is vessel-based enforcement. And if you know where to send them, similar to the SMART protocol, you can be uh, much more effective. And then most importantly, it's not the interception, it's the deterrence of future activity. So this is a really exciting space, and that data is also publicly uh, available, which is, which is quite exciting. Thinking about democratizing and making available uh, uh, spatial data on ecosystems as well. There's two um, uh, projects, one quite far ahead of the other, one on key biodiversity areas. There's no, there's no current standard 
of uh, critically important biodiversity areas around the world that is, that is built from the bottom up. Um, uh, BirdLife International worked on something called important bird areas. Uh, and so other, some other criteria for certain species has emerged, but not one, as they call it, central currency for conservation of some of the most important biodiversity areas in the world, um, done to international standards. So the Key Biodiversity Area Partnership, which is uh, coordinated by the IUCN and WCS and a range of the world's uh, leading conservation organizations are part of it, is a bottom-up process, country-driven, to identify these areas in a globally consistent manner and then make them available to the public, not just the government, but to the public, to companies, who might be thinking about investing to know where to avoid in terms of um, uh, key critical areas for biodiversity. We're also developing, this is a not yet released, released tool, um, more real-time uh, using uh, Google Earth Engine, bringing in uh, uh, real-time data sets and near real-time from a global perspective, not just remote sensing, but I mentioned the crowdsource roads, wildlife surveys when they come in to get a much better picture of what the intactness level of forests and other ecosystems are. This, um, this data set that we're working on in intactness will eventually be available on, on WRI's Global Forest Watch data set so you can see not just what the satellites see but also what we know about from the underlying vector data about roads, settlements, demographics, lights at night, etc. And finally, just two areas linking to the market side of things and and um, the financial piece, which I've notably skipped through for most of this discussion. We have massive investments in the order of trillions of dollars predicted in infrastructure. I don't think, don't think I mentioned the roads graph, but the biggest impact from, from infrastructure is the roads that are created. We think about 20, it's projected about 25 million uh, kilometers of roads will be, uh, new roads will be put on planet Earth by 2050. These roads have tremendous impact and the infrastructure associated on the surrounding ecosystems. In the United States, uh, to, uh, each state has created some sort of financial mechanism to offset the impact of development. So one of the, one, one, one of the ones, that went, at least for a while, until recently has been quite successful in the state of Florida, every single real estate transaction, you pay a fee and that goes into an environmental fund in the state of Florida, and that has created a significant state park system in Florida. So the importance of connecting at every level environmental impact to some offsetting mechanism when you can't entirely avoid it is really important. One project we're working on in, in Africa, the Combo project, is looking at introducing the policy framework for what's known as the mitigation hierarchy. First avoid, but if you can't avoid, then pay, return, pay into a fund to offset that impact so that on the net there is a no net loss of, of biodiversity. A challenging idea, but something that has really helped scale conservation efforts and explains the growth of a number of the, of the leading U.S. conservation organizations here in the U.S. and the resulting protected areas that we have in the U.S. Finally, we'll need to continue on finance and uh, innovative approaches, not just payments for development, um, but insurance schemes, public-private partnerships. How can we think about uh, better finance and conservation beyond grant dollars or bond beyond just government revenue? Um, WCS is also the secretariat for the Conservation Finance Alliance, which is an alliance of uh, several hundred trust funds for different protected areas around the world, thinking about how to leverage better their endowments with a range of innovative financial tools. We'll need to significantly scale these efforts after 2020 to manage that estate, because all the ideas in the world, if they can't be funded, can't be executed. Thank you very much. This is supposed to inspire questions <laughs> or, or rebuttal, either way. Do you want me to pick? Okay. Yes, uh, could you clarify for me um, what the, how the intactness and wilderness coincide? Does, does a forest need to be intact, uh, need to be a wilderness area to be intact and being protected? To further go on with that, when you talk about democratization of conservation, we're looking at a peopled world, so we're thinking about connectivity and keeping that intact and mitigating fragmentation. So. I guess I'm confused a little bit about what's intact, what's wilderness, are they the same? Yeah, so uh, the term wilderness in the U.S. context has a very specific definition because of our Wilderness Act. Um, in, the, in the presentation I made, the, the wilderness areas are those that are fully intact. That is what we're thinking of them as one and the same. But let me lean into one question you asked because I did glance over it, is that 
we think, and it's only going to be possible to secure that intact wilderness with protected areas for only a portion of it. Other areas will have to be community-based conservation convention, indigenous land tenure, and even policies that just res restrict um, infrastructure to the outside of those areas without actually creating parks that need to be, to be management. So parks will be protected areas will be one piece of a global equation to holding on to what remains for intact wilderness. So they are one and the same, and I'm using them. Uh, but I use them separately in this presentation. Can you address the study that just came out? I think it was from Puerto Rico where there was like a 95% collapse of insect species that they found there. And if you're losing all these, these insect species that are the foundation of a lot of these other species, how does that all tie into conservation of all these different uh, the species that actually depend upon what's collapsing right now. Yeah, actually, is a, um, where, where, where I work, there's a curator at the, um, uh, the chief curator at the Central Park Zoo who um, spends his, his day with all these amazing charismatic wildlife at the zoo, but his training is uh, in, um, in insects, and he is actually trying to push at WCS for us to be thinking more about that invertebrate core uh, of wildlife conservation because um, or of conservation generally, sorry, not just wildlife conservation, because they're so important for the structure of the ecosystem. Um, I don't know enough specifically about the Puerto Rico example to talk about it uh, generally, but one of, the, um, one of the big challenges for thinking about that is a whole series of different threats uh, for insects, kind of like the, when you think about coral reefs, it's more environmental or maybe even toxins that are coming in as opposed to the direct poaching or overfishing and overconsumption. So I think a, certainly an intelligent conservation strategy has to deal with the most important threats in places and areas where you're seeing those incredible pressures on invertebrates. That should be the priority. Um, it is a, I actually met with a few student classes here at UVM last, uh, earlier, and, in, and one of the questions was about how do you deal with challenges in 2050 versus challenges today, and conservation is basically all about triage. What's the, what's the biggest driver right now? And unfortunately what that means is you're probably missing something coming in 10 years. But if you didn't do what you did now, you wouldn't be there in 10 years. So there's that challenge. Um, but it's certainly, I think it's an under-prioritized aspect of conservation today for sure. Any other? Oh. Well, I, I get talked pretty loud. Yeah, but it won't record you. <laughs> They need to record it for yeah, I, Oh, I see. So I was just curious. I think you talked much about it, but you know, how much, because I'm a chemist, right, uh, working with Mathai, kind of his colleague. So I wonder, you know, how much, in your opinion, is plastic in the ocean, uh. you know, a problem for the, for the, for the environment, like for, for, for the life in the ocean? It's really just overplayed by us. You know, I know we shouldn't be keeping dumping stuff, but the, the yeah. people, uh, not the people, I mean the fish eat it and they think it's like plankton. And, yeah. But you know, is it just, they need to eat a little more yeah. and it's so, fine or is it really a huge problem? It's a really important question. So uh, actually plastics in the ocean is a, good, is a good example of where information has become much more democratized. We've learned a lot more about what's happening in the oceans and one of the most palatable is can you believe this trash is ending up out there, particularly plastics today? I thought we weren't allowed to do that. You know, we know from scientific research that the vast majority of that is coming from 10 major river systems. Um, and so solving the plastic, ocean, plastic in the ocean uh, challenge is all about waste management in a small set of countries around the world. It's really about trash management. Um, for a, to, but to get to your question, for a specific set of species, uh, uh, marine turtles, seabirds particularly, increasingly some fish we're seeing, particularly larval fish of some species where it may be a longer term, it is an acute threat and very important for those species. On the order of comparing it to say something like global overfishing or depleting of, of, of fish stocks, I would personally put it slightly lower than those, mm -hmm. but it's an area that's very tangible and we shouldn't, it, it shouldn't be an issue for us today given uh, a waste was one of the original parts of the environmental movement. Um, Everyone, I think, knows today, it was five years ago, we all imagined the garbage pass being something we could walk on. I think media has done a good job at sort of re-educating that it's, it's significant. It's not the density that you might imagine, but on the global scale, it's significant, and it's out there, and it's getting into these in, uh, digestive systems. Happy to talk about that more at our reception, hopefully without plastic straws. We'll find out. And in Europe. Yeah, some countries, and Seattle, and... We're trying in New York City as well. 
Um, are there any countries that aren't part of the global organization and has it been hard to kind of enforce rules upon them, if so? Uh, yeah, so I think you mean the Convention on Biological Diversity or did you mean, what, what, what did you mean by global organization? So the U.S. I is not the a, one that's meeting uh, in Yeah, China. so the U.S. is not a party to the Convention on Biological Diversity, which one maybe not surprise anyone, but has not been a party since the beginning, particularly because um, if we had more time to talk about the original um, text, when the Convention on Biological Diversity was negotiated um, in the Rio Convention, it was a divide between conservation and protection versus intellectual property rights and right to develop. And so there's a lot of protections written in on um, intellectual property rights of the biodiversity in your country. And um, the U.S. at the time and still to, to today is not uh, happy signing away those rights of some other country to that country. That's the reason we're not party. But the vast majority of the countries of the world are, for whatever it's worth. Um, given limited funding, does WCS have a general framework for how it thinks about prioritizing investments in conservation. I guess you use the example of uh, with coral reefs, targeting reefs that are the most likely to recover, for example, um, or you just use the word triage. I guess what does that decision-making process within WCS look like? Yeah, so we, on a, on a global per, uh, level, we have a cent we believe in long-term conservation. So we, uh, we have programs that are thinking about conservation from a decadal perspective, which means once we decide to work and invest and partner with government, we're there for, for the long haul. Um, and our filters are really um, those places that still have large intact assemblages of wildlife and the ecosystems that support them, but also have some credible threat on them today. So we're not in these places that are far, far away from anything. Um, and also are in need of significant capacity, their financial or technical resources. So that tends to put us in developing countries, particularly developing tropics, both for reefs and forests. We have worked and we still do have broken in temperate areas as well, um, but that is not necessarily our focus. So large aggregations, intact ecosystems, and we tend to prioritize actually at a landscape and seascape scale, even within those countries. Hey, thanks for a great talk. So a lot of NGOs have been shifting and conservation conversations have been shifting away from sort of biodiversity conservation for its own sake to biodiversity conservation for our sake. So ecosystem service type arguments, well-being as an outcome that we're after, not just global biodiversity. Uh, could you just talk a little bit about how WCS sees itself on that spectrum and how's that been changing, say, in the last 10 years? Yeah, so you're 100% uh, right. The, the whole sector, um, even sustainable development goals, as articulated by the idea of sustainable development, has shifted towards um, uh, why, why protect nature for people versus nature for nature's sake. Um, uh, we have, the reason I switched the slides is to show uh, one of our, our mottos, we stand for wildlife. We've intentionally decided as an organization to stay focused from a mission perspective primarily on wildlife and biodiversity. In our mission statement, it does include for the well-being of people, but uh, our, our, our ethic is much more on that side in recognition that so many other groups have shifted towards nature, conserving nature for people. And if there aren't some organizations that stay focused on wildlife and conservation, we'll be missing some important pieces of the puzzle. So um, the reality is, I said, um, actually it also took class earlier, on the ground is when you get to a real conservation challenge, um, even the two ethics when you come together, you're gonna, going back to triage, you're gonna take on an, uh, an approach that is both human-centric and wildlife-centric to have a successful model of conservation. Um, but our, our, our organizing principle and missions and values are more on the wildlife and biodiversity side. All right, I think we have time for one last question. And as EMC, I'm gonna take it. All right, uh, <laughs> no, just MC. I don't know where the E came from. All right, uh, roads. Why are, other than decimating the local squirrel and rabbit population, what, why are roads so impactful? Yeah, so there's um, it just incredible Evidence, even the, uh, some, some recent data has suggested the Amazon, 95% of deforestation can essentially be explained by being within five kilometers of a road. So 
it's of course the, the subsistence or maybe even small scale commercial hunting, but then the illegal small scale agriculture that comes in, illegal logging that comes in, it basically provides that vein of access. So um, it's it, a whole range of activities that can, that can um, be associated with it, not just the hunting, but the clearing of the forest and then the land use afterwards for economic activity. You know, to, to reiterate this point about roads, it, when, when mines, oil and gas, mining uh, uh, activities go in to otherwise unaffected areas, the acute impact of that mine is nowhere near the long-term effect of the road that's coming in uh, to what, from a wildlife and biodiversity conservation area. Chemi from a chemistry perspective, actually the mining area might be the most important, uh, the, the issues used, but on an aggregate scale, the impact of that road will be much greater um, due to the range of factors I mentioned. Okay, well, uh, let me remind you all that there is a reception following up in Waterman Manor, Manor and uh, please join me in, in thanking Dr. McLennan for a wonderful talk. Thank you very much.